Good morning, everyone. It's Brad Berzer for our second American Heritage Lecture. While well, you guys are sadly absent from campus, uh, this is, if you guys remember, Brad Berzer. So, did I say that already? If I did, I'm sorry. Here's my coffee. I have not had enough of it yet this morning, but here we go. So, I am actually recording this for the March 25th. 2020 class, but I'm recording this uh, a day early, trying to keep up this way and make sure everything's ready. So this is actually March 24th. All right, so I hope you guys are all doing well, staying safe, very safe. I want you to all be very safe. I'm eager for you to get back to campus. Uh, we actually had a ton of snowfall yesterday, and now it's mostly melted. But anyway, if you guys are wondering what's going on at Hillsdale, and of course the governor just gave the lockdown order, so there's not much we can do in terms of leaving the house. But me being me, I've still got to get my exercise, so I'm going to be heading out soon for a uh, some kind of walk with the dog, Chesterton. In fact, you may hear him. He's being a little restless right now. And if you've got some backing in the back background, I apologize for that. Uh, he's a really good dog, actually. But, you know, he just he gets barky bark, uh, as my wife would say. So who knows what's going on with him right now. But we'll get him out for a walk soon. And maybe the two of us will get arrested. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what the... Oh, there he was. Did you guys hear that? Anyway, it'd be interesting to see what the cops do. Uh, I assume they wouldn't consider him having legal common law rights, but um, you never know. We'll, we'll find out. Okay, on a serious note, good morning. Today, we are going to be talking about the fascinating, if someone I don't like, but uh, really important figure of John C. Calhoun. And I want to look at the document that you have in your reader on page 373, The Disquisition on Government by John C. Calhoun. You can see there uh, his exact dates for his life, 1782 to 1850, and that he was a U.S. Senator from South Carolina twice. And you can see those, those long periods there where he was. Uh, but I want to start off by reading to you from, first of all, the Atlantic Monthly in 1860, or I'm sorry, 1884, but looking back to 1860, and then also from William Howard Russell, who was the main observer of the American Civil War from the London Times. But here's E.G. Mason from the Atlantic Monthly remembering his 1860 journey to South Carolina. When some natives of the state took a visiting North, uh, northern student, that is E.G. Mason, to Calhoun's grave in 1860, they treated it as a Roman Catholic might reverence a shrine. And the culmination of the sentiment was reached when the northern visitor was taken to the grave of John C. Calhoun. Then, if never before, this visiting student continued. In hindsight, the Charlestonians expected that the would-be pilgrim would feel a due sense of his own inferiority to the natives of the soil, which the presence of that one superhuman individual had made more sacred than aught all else on Mother Earth. William Howard Russell, writing for the London Times in 1861, was trying to figure out exactly what made South Carolina secede, and they did secede on December 20th of 1860, what made them secede? He said, the founder of their school was St. Calhoun. Here in South Carolina, his pupils carry out their teaching in thunder and fire. States' rights are displayed after its legitimate teaching, and the palmetto flag and the red bars of the Confederacy are its exposition. And that is really not an exaggeration. Uh, everywhere that you would go in South Carolina, especially in that fall of 1860 and that spring of 1861, you would find the bust, as well as the memory and the ideas of John C. Calhoun. Now, whether or not those people who believed in secession actually got John C. Calhoun correct is another question. But that's what I want to talk about now. I want to talk about John C. Calhoun's ideas what he's expecting, what he did expect, what he thought the nature of the Constitution and the government should be, and what role that played in leading towards the American Civil War. So John C. Calhoun is uh, Scotch-Irish. He comes from South Carolina, and he ends up getting a scholarship to get a liberal arts classical education at Yale under the great Timothy Dwight. And Dwight's brother taken with John C. Calhoun. Calhoun himself, he's such a, he's such a weird figure. 
I, in, in terms of his actual mind and intelligence, if we just separated that aspect of Calhoun from the rest of his personality and his being, I, I think that you could say that he is worthy of standing intellectually up there with Jefferson. He is truly one of the finest minds that America has ever produced. But if you want to look at John C. Calhoun as a person, he's pretty shady. Uh, if you want to look at him as a politician, he's extremely shady. And so there's always this weird aspect to Calhoun that when I look at him, I have a love-hate relationship with him. There are things about him I love, his, his ideas, not that I agree with them, but I think they're amazing. Uh, and then you look at his personality, and he's very disappointing, uh, especially compared to some of the other greats of the day. John Quincy Adams was uh, just a paragon of virtue, and that's not at all what we would call Calhoun as a slaveholder, as um, a Southern politician. It, this guy was really Machiavellian and really manipulative. Uh, he betrayed Andrew Jackson, uh, really, uh, not literally, but symbolically stabbed him in the back. Uh, just a, a really nasty person as a person. But again, as nasty as he was as a person, he was brilliant as a thinker. So if we look at his disquisition on government, which is usually regarded as his most famous writing, and he definitely had a lot of writings uh, and was involved in a lot of the intellectual arguments of his day. And we start there on page 373. We see right at the beginning, but government, although intended to protect and preserve society, has itself a strong tendency to disorder and abuse of its powers, as all experience and almost every page of history testify. The cause is to be found in the same constitution of our nature which makes government indispensable. The powers which it is necessary for government to possess in order to repress violence and preserve orders cannot execute themselves. They must be administered by men in whom, like others, the individual are strong than the social feelings. And hence, the powers vested in them to prevent injustice and oppression on the part of others will, if left unguarded, be by they them converted into instruments to oppress the rest of the community. That by which this is prevented, by whatever name it is called, is what is meant by constitution in its most comprehensive sense when applied to government. Having its origin in the same principle of our nature, constitution stands to government as government stands to society, and as the end for which society is ordained would be defeated without government, so that for which government is ordained would, in a great measure, be defeated without constitution. But they differ in this striking particular. There is no difficulty in forming government. It is not even a matter of choice whether there shall be one or not. Like breathing, it is not permitted to depend on our volition. Necessity will force it on all communities in some form or another. Very different is the case as to constitution. Instead of a matter of necessity, it is one of the most difficult tasks imposed on man to form a constitution worthy of the name, while to form a perfect one, one that would completely counteract the tendency of government to oppression and abuse and hold it strictly to the great ends for which it is ordained, has thus far exceeded human wisdom, and possibly ever will. From this, another striking difference results. Constitution is the contrivance of man, while government is of divine ordinance. And then if we jump over onto the opposite page, on page 375, right there at line 23, we find a quick discussion about democracy. The right of suffrage of itself can do more, no more than give complete control to those who elect over the conduct of those who have been elected. In doing this, it accomplishes all it possibly can accomplish. This is, it, this is its aim. And when this is attained, the end is fulfilled. It can do no more, however enlightened the people, or however widely extended or well guarded the right may be. The sum total then of its effects, when most successful, is to make those elected the true and faithful representatives of those who elected them instead of irresponsible rulers, as they would be without it, 
and thus by converting it into an agency and the rulers into agents to divest government of all claims of sovereignty and to retain it unimpaired to the community. So there is a role for suffrage. It maintains a kind of barrier against those who would abuse their power. And we can withdraw our vote and therefore withdraw our support for those who would abuse us. Now, a lot of what I just read sounds like gibberish. Because, like so many great thinkers, for better or worse, Calhoun is really using much of his own vocabulary, and he's defining words in ways that we wouldn't necessarily. So let me break this down and give you the five points that I think are necessary to understand Calhoun's political thought. And you do need to understand his political thought. Again, I'm not asking any of you to agree with it or to like Calhoun, but he is a first-rate mind. And if nothing else, no matter what decrepit, how decrepit he was as a person, we owe it to him because of his brilliance to understand what he's trying to do. Plus, it'll help us understand why the South was ready to move towards civil war and did actually move towards civil war in December of 1860. So before I get to those five points, I want to make what I consider to be a fascinating prelude to John C. Calhoun's arguments on states' rights and decentralization. And that is, if we look at John C. Calhoun in the 18-teens, we find him not only as Secretary of War, but as a representative from South Carolina. We find him as, ironically, perhaps the single most nationalistic, centralizing person in all of government. He is a war hawk. He desperately wants war against Great Britain in the War of 1812. But one of the reasons he wants war so badly is that it will give an excuse to be able to nationalize federal programs and to centralize the power of the federal government. Now, that's that sounds really weird because we just read that he wants decentralization. But something fundamentally changes in the nature of Calhoun, and it probably changes during the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which we're not going to talk about right now, but we will later. Uh, but I want you to just keep that in mind, that there's a kind of watershed moment in American history, this switch from an understanding of what government is through the Compromise of 1820, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But here we have John C. Calhoun, Secretary of War, in 1817. He says, let it not be forgotten, let it be forever kept in mind that the extent of the Republic exposes us to the greatest of calamities, disunion, which was the kind of polite term in the 18-teens for secession, disunion, right, the breaking up of the Union. Calhoun warned as Secretary of War in February of 1817, we are great and rapidly, I was about to say fearfully growing. This is our pride and danger our weakness, and our strength. We are under the most imperious obligations to counteract every tendency to disunion. Whatever impedes the intercourse of the extremes with this, the center of the republic, weakens the union. And here we have something that makes him sound like Doctor Who. Let us then bind the republic together with a perfect system of roads and canals. Let us conquer space. I love that, right? It, it, total nationalist sentiment. We can conquer space. And that, of course, means, as we've talked about in class, though it's been a while, remember, space and the West are terms basically meaning the future of the Republic, which means the history of the Republic and the history, therefore, of all Republics. So we need to bind this Republic together with a perfect system of roads and canals let us conquer space. So that's Calhoun prior to the Missouri Compromise of 1820. But then we have that compromise in 1820, which was led by Clay, Henry Clay. And with that compromise, we have Missouri coming into the Union, should have been a northern state, but had the population of a southern state. So we get this compromise in which we have a slave state in the middle of the northern states of the West. And it looks like the West will now be populated by slavery. And yet there seems to be such opposition to that in the North that people like John C. Calhoun 
grow extremely fearful of the federal government, realizing for the first time that if the federal government can be used to protect slavery, it can also be used to take down slavery. And at that point, Calhoun seems to change in his own ideas, and he starts thinking much more about an idea of decentralization or perhaps disunion, though I don't think he ever actually goes as far as disunion because he has this belief of the Republic that is deeply, deeply Roman, as we'll, we'll see here in just a moment. And that Republic will, through its own decentralization, prevent its own breakup through further decentralization. In other words, the decentralization that Calhoun envisions is really a kind of never-ending decentralization. So here are the five points that are absolutely necessary, fundamental, to understand John C. Calhoun's vision of government. Number one, there never has been, and there never can be, and there never will be, an actual state of nature. So immediately, Calhoun is challenging Hobbes, he's challenging Locke, and he's challenging Rousseau. Anybody who says there's a state of nature, Calhoun says, is either a fool or he's playing games and he's manipulative. He writes, but such a state of nature is purely hypothetical. It never did nor can exist. It is inconsistent with the preservation and perpetuation of the rest, the race, excuse me. It is therefore a great misnomer to call it the state of nature. Instead of being the natural state of man, it is of all conceivable states the most opposed to his nature, the most repugnant to his feelings, and the most incompatible with his wants. So Calhoun says, we have to throw out all of Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau, but I should also have made the leap already. That means we have to throw out Jefferson, too. And all of those theorists who believe in a state of nature are just dead wrong. And Calhoun's argument is this. Not only is it contrary to the state of human nature and the possibilities of human nature, but if we look mythically and historically, there has never existed a state of nature. If we go all the way back to the creation in the Garden of Eden, when we go back to Genesis 1, we see that God creates with order and authority. We look then at Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and we find that God has not only created with order and authority, but when he creates man, he immediately gives man two things. The duty to name all things, there's a law, institutionally, no state of nature, and to have stewardship over nature itself. And then in chapter two, we get a third thing. That is when God creates woman out of man, he makes the first institution, the institution of marriage or family. So Calhoun's argument is if we look at our own mythological, religious, theological understanding of society, we don't ever have a state of nature. And it is repugnant then to argue that there could be a state of nature. And he takes it a little bit further. He says, we don't even have to think about Adam and Eve and the fall in Eden. We can look at all of human history and we never find a state of nature except in purely barbaric societies, ones in which there is just nothing but savagery. Instead, there are always orders, there are always rules, there are always habits, there are always norms, there are always customs, mores, that hold people together. Even if there's not a formal system of law, there is always an informal system of law. So number one, there can never be a state of nature. And all theories that begin with a state of nature are therefore, for Calhoun, null and void. And we have to think about, all right, what does that mean then? So number two, what do we find is point number two. We find that God ordains government to protect his order. So number two, God ordains government. We as human beings have absolutely no choice in the matter. We do not get to choose between no government and government. We only get to choose among various forms of government. God demands it. It's in his very being and in his very nature that there is order. That order must reveal itself in the governance of man over man and in the governance of God 
over man as well. So never can there be a possibility of no government existing. Calhoun writes on this, Liberty must and ever ought to yield to protection, as the existence of the race is of greater moment than its improvement. And, contra Locke, that is counter to everything Locke said, governments have absolutely no right to grant liberty, as liberty is a reward to be earned, not a blessing to be gratuitously lavished on all alike, but rather a reward reserved for the intelligent, the patriotic, the virtuous, and the deserving. So, God demands government. Government is a natural function that comes out of creation itself. But point number three, and this should have been obvious in point number one, even though man has no choice over being governed, he has every choice in the world to choose what form of government he so desires. And God probably doesn't pick favorites when it comes to types of governments. It could be a monarchy or an aristocracy or democracy. It could be an oligarchy. It could be uh, whatever form of government makes sense to the people at the time, and God will probably be okay with that. Now, if we had to pick and choose, Calhoun would definitely choose a republic, and a very complicated republic is the highest form of government. But this is not up to God. This is up to man. So we have no choice, as point number two said, with government. But number three, we have every choice in the world of what government we create. And Calhoun uses the term here, constitution. So when he says government, he means that thing of which we have no choice. God demands it. But when he says constitution, that is our choice, our free will, determining what kind of ordinance and government we want over us. So he says, constitution is the contrivance of man, while government is of divine ordination. Man is left to perfect what the wisdom of the infinite ordained as necessary to preserve the race. So man gets to choose his own constitution. And again, for Calhoun, that means generally we would prefer at the height of our civilization a very complicated republic. Now, I'm going to take a quick break here in my five points because I want to just describe what it is that Calhoun envisions. And you have to, you have to kind of imagine Calhoun, classically trained but southern aristocrat, coming out of this Southern patriarchy, what is it he believes? So we've got to tie a couple of things together from Western heritage. So remember, and I realize for many of you, it's been a while since you had Western heritage, but one of the great arguments of the Roman constitution was that the Roman constitution was never written, but it developed very slowly and organically over time. So it begins by abolishing the kings of the Etruscans, and it creates the Senate, Senate literally meaning a body of old wise men, and creates that Senate as an aristocracy. But over time, it not only creates executives and judges, tribunes and consuls, but it also creates the assembly of the people, what we would call the House of Representatives, but what they just in Rome called the people, so that you do end up with a, pri a tripartite form of government in which you have executive, judicial, legislative, you have monarchical, not really monarchical, but monarchical, at least symbolically, and aristocratic and democratic. All of those things fall together because the republic is natural. Calhoun is absolutely fascinated with the idea that the Constitution developed organically over time. There was no single founding of the Roman Constitution. And Calhoun is nothing if not a Roman in his understanding. So I would ask you, if you want to think about who he most resembles in the ancient world as a slaveholder, as a patriarch, as a Republican, he basically is Cato the Elder. Not Cato the Younger, but Cato the Elder. And if you remember, Cato the Elder was absolutely firm about his own convictions and the way that he treated his wife, the way he treated his slaves, the way he treated his allies, the way he treated his enemies. And that, in many ways, though lacking much of the virtue, that is Calhoun. 
in the 19th century. But you have to think of one other figure. And remember, Calhoun is Scotch-Irish, and that means he's nominally Presbyterian. Now, he's a really bad Presbyterian. He's not a good Presbyterian, but he knows his Calvin. And so he thinks of not just the Republic of Ancient Rome, but the Republic of Geneva, that is, of Calvin's Reformational Republic. And so to understand Calhoun, his vision not only of government, but of the human person, you have to be able to kind of mesh Cato the Elder with John Calvin. Right? That, that's the mix. And if you can get that right, you'll have an understanding of John C. Calhoun. So that mix of Cato the Elder and John Calvin. All right, so away from my little quasi-deviation, but I think an important deviation there. And that is point number four in all of these points. Man must, in his government, whatever that government may be, he must always balance two things. And this is, this is a little bit harder to explain. The other stuff all makes sense. But now he must ban it, balance two things. He must balance A, the sense of the majority, with B, the sense of the community. Now, what does that mean? It's hard to explain. And I still have to kind of think about it myself, even though I've been teaching this for so long and thinking and teaching Calhoun for so long. But this is the way to think about it. The will of the majority is what we think at a moment. So right now, here in March of 2020, what is our vision? And you know, think about what's going on as I'm lecturing here with the coronavirus and all these governors who are declaring for all intents and purposes, martial law. Uh, they're basically giving a, a no release order. Right? You can't, can't leave your no leave order. You can't leave your house. Uh, if you do, only one person can leave and go to the grocery store. Uh, and when you're outside, you have to stand six feet apart. Now there's a habit to that, obviously, but at the moment, Many of us, even those of us who may be radically libertarian, are okay with it. I'm not giving you my own views on this. I actually, well, it doesn't matter what I think. But regardless, many people are accepting of this governmental responsibility. But once this crisis is over and we start thinking about what did we do through that moment, a lot of cooler heads will prevail and people will say, you know, the governor really didn't have the right to do that. So the sense of the majority is what we're feeling at this moment right now, what our emotions, our passions feel. But the sense of the community is the long view. Well, wait a minute. Okay, yeah, we were pretty worked up in that moment. But when we can step back and say, doesn't the First Amendment guarantee our right to assemble and petition? Well, then what does a state governor have the right to do to declare us not to be able to assemble and petition, even in the midst of crisis? So again, I'm not trying to give you my views on any of this. I just want you to understand if this is a current moment, this would be the difference between the sense of the majority, what we're feeling right now, right? Just uh, don't do this as I'm lecturing, but maybe later, get on Twitter, Find out what the anger is about this or that or who's worked up about something. And then step back from Twitter and say, well, what about first principles? What would the Constitution say? What would the founding say? That second part is our sense of community versus our sense of majority. So we have to always balance these two things. We would be fools to say that the immediate emotion doesn't matter. It clearly matters. And emotion can obviously cloud our judgment. And so you could be as reasonable as you want with someone right now, but if they're in the midst of panic or hysteria, your reason will go nowhere. And therefore, you have to take into account that human nature can be volatile. And you have to understand that. But you have to do both. So here's a bit of a long quote from Calhoun, but here is how he says this. It is manifest that this provision must be of a character calculated to prevent any one interest or combination of interests from using the powers of government to aggrandize itself at the expense of, expense of others. Here lies the evil and just in proportion as it shall prevent or fail to prevent it, in the same degree it will erect or fail to effect the end intended that it is, can be accomplished. There is but one certain mode in which this result can be secured, and that is 
by the adoption of some restriction or limitation which shall so effectively prevent any one interest or combination of interests from obtaining the exclusive control of the government as to render hopeless all attempts to direct that end. There is, again, but one mode in which this can be effected, and this is by taking the sense of each interest or the portion of the community which may be unequally and injuriously affected by the action of the government separately through its own majority or in some way by which its voice may be fairly expressed and to require the consent of each interest either to put or to keep the government in action. So we always have to have that balance, that sense of majority. That is, what are we feeling right now? with that sense of community, which is our first principles, that is going back to right reason. Those two things are always in a bit of tension. Now, Calhoun is obviously not talking about the coronavirus. He is talking about slavery. And he wants to make sure that the passions of the Northern abolitionists do not override the sense of the community of the South. So the sense of the majority, the North, crazy, from his perspective, he's wrong, of course, but the sense of the North, uh, the sense of the majority, the North, the crazies, and the sense of the South, the Southern landowners as conservative, and therefore the sense of the community itself. He's trying to preserve those things. All right, so this takes us then to point number five, the final point dealing with Calhoun's vision of government. And point number five is this. Every community. So think about what we've talked about with Hillsdale. We'll make Hillsdale the Republic, and then we'll make all the sororities and fraternities and various groups within, we'll make them little communities within the Republic. Communities must possess a negative, a veto, a check, an interposition, or a nullification. So the idea that Calhoun says is just as the legislature of the United States can veto what a president says, so maybe our class in Lane 236 could veto something Dr. Arn said. That is, we would have the ability not to exit the community and say, oh, we Lane 236 Brazarians can simply leave, but we say, no, Dr. Arn, we don't agree with that policy, and therefore we declare it null and void. Now, I'm not recommending this. <laughs> I think it would be quite foolish. But if you can transport that idea and think about what we might be able to do within a republic to what might happen in Calhoun's day and age, he's basically arguing that if the North tries to abolish slavery, the South can simply say no through a check a veto, a negative, an interposition, or a nullification. So the only way for power to defeat power is for the lesser power to have the ability to nullify the greater power. Just as Congress has the right to veto the legislation, or excuse me, to, uh, I got that wrong, didn't I? Uh, the president to veto the legislation of Congress and then Congress can override it, so too we should have those kinds of ideas among all various aspects of society, not just of that one dealing with the president and the legislature. So here he is on this, his idea. He says, a proper constitution must give to each interest or portion of the community a negative on all of the others. It is this mutual negative among its various conflicting interests which invests each with the power of protecting itself and places the rights and safety of each where only they can be securely placed under its own guardianship. Such a negative would be a veto, an interposition, a nullification, a check, a balance of power. Now, here's the problem with Calhoun's idea. As interesting as it may sound on paper, and I hope you guys had in mind what was going on with the Roman Republic, where you develop these various positions to oppose the positions that exist, such as the creation of the people or the assembly against the Senate. If you could do that in America, how would you do it? 
And this is the problem with Calhoun. Calhoun's idea is fascinating, that we would each have the ability to veto the greater power above us without leaving the community. But how would we actually make it work? That is, what would we do to prevent the federal government from abusing its power besides just simply saying no? And Calhoun never really gives us any kind of idea of what that might be. That is, how we might actually go about nullifying or interposing or trying to stop what the federal government is doing. Now, South Carolina, under John C. Calhoun's leadership, does attempt to nullify the federal tariff law in the early 1830s. But they are unsuccessful in doing so, and in large part because Andrew Jackson responds very, very swiftly and, for all intents and purposes, threatens to put South Carolina under martial law to prevent them from nullifying this federal law. And the issue is really a quiet one, well, loud if you're a Southerner, but quiet as far as the country goes all the way up until the Civil War. But Calhoun has been dead for about a decade, almost exactly a decade, when the Civil War erupts. So here's the, the funny thing about this. And remember as we started now, what time is it? Uh, basically 35 minutes ago. And I read to you this idea of Calhoun being Saint Calhoun, being the patron saint of the South. So all of these Southerners are always quoting Calhoun and at least using him as this image. But it's not actually clear that Calhoun ever believed in secession or leaving the Union. I think a stronger argument would be that Calhoun always remained in some weird way a nationalist but a nationalist who wanted so much to decentralize the government as though he might look as though he's a secessionist. But that's mostly because he's never able to articulate convincingly or fully what his vision, vision of a veto or a nullification or a check or his balance of power may be. Regardless, those are the five points. So let me sum those up again, especially for those of you at home taking notes. Number one. There is no state of nature, never has existed, never can exist. Number two, God ordains government without the choice of man. Man does not get to choose whether to believe in government or not. God has ordained it as a part of his own nature and a part of his own creation. Number three, man then chooses his form of government, and that is what Calhoun labels constitution. How do we constitute that governance. And in that, we have every choice in the world. And for Calhoun, the best form of a government is the republic and a very decentralized republic and a republic based on kind of the wisdom of the aristocracy. Point number four, every government, whatever type it is, must understand that in some way it has to balance the interest of the majority with the interest of community. That is the sense of the majority, the immediate, the here and now, the passions, with the sense of the community, that is with the logic and the first principles of that community. And finally, number five, all communities must, not only, not only can, but must, actually possess that negative, a veto, a check, an interposition, a nullification, some form of a balance of power. And only then will we have a truly effective republic. So Calhoun is envisioning a small but effective government. And certainly he's envisioning the idea of having a, a relatively strong understanding of things. Okay, now I, I wanna switch something here. And I haven't done this yet, so let's hope this works. I am going to turn on, uh, if it lets me. Actually, it's not going to let me. I had to do that earlier, I guess. Okay, you guys, I'm going to stop for one moment, pause, and then I'm going to add in, as you'll see here in just a moment, I'm going to add in the screen for our last few minutes of class. Okay, hold on. I'll be right back. Okay, guys, I'm back. Hopefully uh, this is working now. 
And I, I just wanted to show you, I don't see myself, so maybe I'm not doing FaceTime now, but I hope that you can see the screen here. And I have right in the middle of this title slide, the shattering of the Republic. And I'm not going to go through all of this right now, but I do want to go through a little bit. So uh, these maps actually, and I don't know if I have to do this for copyright reason or not, since this is public, but I do want to give a footnote here. These maps come from about 20 years ago. Uh, they were the maps that came with the Tyndall and She Volume America Narrative History from W.W. W. Norton. So if there's any representative from W.W. W. Norton, uh, I apologize for using this without express permission, but I'm assuming under fair use, I have the right to do that. And there's Brad's attempt at legalese. So let's look at this for a moment. Uh, this is, if you remember from what I was saying just a little bit ago, this is really the, the most important law that changes in the early republic. And of course, we've already talked about slavery, and I have that lecture posted here on YouTube if any of you want to go back and look at that issue of slavery. But I do ask you to remember, and if you guys will think back, I gave you two names, Rufus King and William Pickney. And I said, you need to write these names now, down now, but we won't get to what they actually do for a while. And here they are now in our last few minutes of class. So what we have here is a map of 1819 and 1820. And you can see here, and I hope this is recording properly, but I'm pointing to Missouri, which desires in 1819 to come in as a slave state. And notice where it is geographically. It is a strange northern aberration because there, it's kind of sticking up into the middle of these free areas. And you guys should remember that Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, this was the old Northwest Ordinance Territory. And that territory, as described by Congress on July 13th of 1787, was meant to be completely slave-free by Article 6 of the Northwest Ordinance. And the theory was, at the time that this was created, it was that this would be a signal, remember our understanding of the West, is the understanding of the future of America. And therefore, whatever the history of the Republic is, it is a Republic that extends through time and space all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And so if these territories here in 1787 are made free territories, that is, absent of slavery, then many people in the Congress and at the time of the founding presume that slavery will remain only in these states that began with the beginning of the Union, with the formation of independence, that is basically Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, that these states of the original 13 would maintain their slavery for a while until it naturally died out, but it would not extend into the Western territories. Now, suddenly in 1819, we have Missouri, somewhat unexpectedly, at least for those not living in Missouri, wanting to come in, and a fifth of its population is black slave. So one out of every five people living in Missouri in 1819 is enslaved. And Missouri wants to come in as a slave state. And this is a huge, I mean, I can't, we can't even fathom what a culture shock this was, because we've never gone through anything quite this dramatic as what we see with Missouri trying to come in in 1819. And the two sides divide quickly. Those which are pro-accepting of the Missouri uh, of Missouri coming in as a slave state, and those are anti. And the anti-Missouri forces are led by none other than one of the founding fathers, Rufus King. And the southern pro-Missouri forces are led by none other than founding father, William Pickney. So these same guys who were arguing with one another about the institution of slavery in August of 1787 at the Constitutional Convention, are still arguing in 1819 and 1820. But, as we know, Missouri does come in. And, of course, there's that word compromise. And here's the compromise. The compromise is Missouri can come in as a slave state. But this line right here, called 3630, that line, which divides Missouri from Arkansas, and 
basically, not quite, but close enough, Kansas from Oklahoma later on, that line, 3630, will be the new Mason-Dixon line. So that line that separated Maryland from Pennsylvania will now separate Missouri from Arkansas beyond Missouri. So everything to the west of Missouri, north of 3630, meaning Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, these states or what will come in as those states, I don't know the names of them yet, those will be free, but everything to the south of 3630, Arkansas, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, theoretically, right? All of these states would come in as slave states. That's the new compromise. But because they want to keep parity within the Senate and make sure that the number of northern senators is equal to the number of southern senators, they also include not just Missouri coming in, but Maine. Maine had been the last territory held by a state. It had been held by Massachusetts. Now Maine will come in as a free state to counterbalance Missouri. Now, it's a compromise. Nobody is really happy about this. But I want you to understand two things about this for right now. Number one, the Missouri Compromise and the whole debate around Missouri in 18, 19, 18, 20, and 21 is the single most polarizing thing to happen to America since independence itself. This is the first great crack where suddenly Northerners are saying, wait a minute, we gave you three compromises to get rid of this institution. And Southerners are saying, we've now had this institution for almost 30 years after the Constitution, and you Northerners are so blind to who and what we are that you haven't even known that it has become central to our own life and our own economy. So Southerners are angry, Northerners are angry, everyone is angry about this. And the country will really not heal all the way up until the Civil War. And of course, then there's not a healing except through blood. But that becomes the great compromise. And this compromise of Missouri, and this is going to sound weird to us, but the compromise was so fierce that in 1820, when the compromise was made, people considered it to have constitutional weight. So they considered it almost like an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, even though the Constitution was not actually amended. But that's how strongly they felt about this. Okay, well, I think it's time to close our class. Uh, we've reached, I think, our time limit now, if I'm counting my time right, and I think I am, though I'm not totally positive. But I would ask all of you, so this has been our, even though I'm recording this on Tuesday, this is our Wednesday class. But I would ask all of you for our Friday class, which of course I'll record on Thursday, but I would ask all of you uh, to read a number of things that we have in the selection on sectionalism in the Civil War. So I would ask you to read George Fitzhugh, Sociology for the South, Frederick Douglass, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, and I would like you to read the Lincoln-Douglas debates and also King Cotton. So please read all of those. So let me repeat those again. George Fitzhugh, Sociology of the South, Frederick Douglass, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. I would also like you to read the Lincoln-Douglas debates that we have here and King Cotton. All right, everybody. Uh, I hope this was coherent. I hope it works. I'll try and piece this together here in a moment. I'll find out if it all worked. But once again, uh, please know that I miss you guys very much. I'm very eager for you to get back to campus, but I am also very prayerful and hopeful that we all stay very safe. And uh, as always, uh, love one another, be good to one another, don't drive your parents crazy, <laughs> and tell them not to drive you crazy. Uh, we're all in this together. We'll make it, even though we're individuals at the moment, we are still a community. Uh, I love you guys, miss you guys, and uh, God bless. I'll see you in two days.